Amen. Thank you. Beautiful worship, ladies. It's just a wonderful time to, to really make that our focus, the, the, the power of the name of Jesus, which is what we have been going over and, and um, studying over the last couple of weeks. So let's go ahead and open up our Bibles, and we are going to pick up where we left off in Acts 2, uh, 42. I don't have any slides for you this week. You're just going to have to write notes in your in your notes. Sorry, no slides today. Um, and, but go ahead and uh, get your own paper out and, and finish those. And uh, then if you want my... My actual notes here, you're welcome to get those, those of you who like those later, you're welcome to have those. So we open up um, Acts 2, 42, and we have, um, we have just witnessed Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we have this um, moment of glimpse of the ideal you know, church and the ideal community. And maybe even as you are um, looking at Acts, you're thinking, gosh, I want what they have. You know, I want that church. I want that, that life. I think we're, we're wired for that. We're wired for ideal, right? And God made us that way. We, um, we want to be maybe the ideal friend, maybe the ideal wife. We, we, um, we read books about ideal societies even, um, on social media portrays everything that could possibly be the ideal, you know, that we go out there for. Advertising is geared toward getting us to want the ideal uh, market of what is being sold to us. Uh, political manifestos, entire nations have been established on ideals. Our own country began with the words, we the people, in order to form what? A perfect union, right? We want, this is what we want. This is how we want to be defined. And so we, we open up here in Acts, and we see the reality, and not just the, the hope and the dream of an ideal, of, but the reality of what happens when the Holy Spirit is poured out. <coughs> and we see the continued fulfillment of Acts 1.8, our first verse we memorized, that they would receive power from the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit would come upon them, and they would be witnesses in Jerusalem, and of course in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So last time we saw the coming down and the power coming down of the word is now going out in today's message in Acts 2. And we're going to see Acts 1-8 continue to be fulfilled as the apostles are continue to be filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So this ideal church, this Holy Spirit filled church. And Luke actually won't refer to church by name. We're not going to hear that word church called um, Until this lesson coming up, you're going to read about that. But this birth of the called out ones, the ecclesia, that's the Greek word for church, is what we're witnessing here. And verse 42 kicks it off with this powerful devotion that defines who they are. And they devoted devoted themselves. And that great Greek word is this idea of steadfast and ongoing, continual act. They were devoted to what? The apostles teaching the apostles teaching and that word is the word where we get our word doctrine from so don't be afraid of the word doctrine i actually heard someone say oh doctrine i don't need that i just love jesus and i want to hear about all the doctrine stuff well that is not what the ideal church was looking like they were devoted to the doctrine or the teaching of the apostles there was no written epistles yet they had to get it straight from the apostles and they were devoted to hearing that and aren't you like that when you're hearing someone that you really enjoy or you're listening to a speaker and you're like, I just can't get enough of this or even even a great worship time. I just can't get enough. I want to absorb all of that. That is how this church was looking. So they were embracing doctrine and what else were they embracing? Fellowship. You see that next. And they were embracing or committed to and devoted to the fellowship. And that's our word, uh, koinonia. Maybe you're familiar with that word as well. And then also to the breaking of bread and to the prayer. So they're embracing and they're receiving and they're correctly responding to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit by being committed to doctrine, committed to fellowship, committed to the coming together, the breaking of bread, not only in just having a meal together, but in taking communion and to prayer. And so awe comes upon every soul. Of course it would, because you're in this amazing spirit-filled environment. Everyone's looking around going, this is amazing. This is exactly how I feel like it should be. 
when you when you see something and experience something that is so powerful, don't you just look at each other going, isn't this great? And just getting that affirming nod from everybody around you. So awe comes upon every soul, and many wonders and signs are being done through the apostles. And we're going to see the Terata and the Samia, wonders and signs throughout the rest of Acts. He'll flip it around later and he'll say signs and wonders, but it, you're going to see the same thing coming up throughout Acts, the wonders and signs. And all who believed were together. They had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and their belongings, distributing the proceeds to all as all had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day, those who are being saved. So do we see here uh, an, an example of what the ideal church should be in the sense that they should be um, having um, a political ideology? Um, that has been said before, that maybe the church should be more like this and, and have um, communism even. And there's actually a Christian version of communism. When I was preparing for this, I actually looked up the origins of communism and where it came from. And actually, there's a, a Christian version of it, even though Karl Marx was an atheist. But this isn't communism, or and it's not socialism. It's commonism. They had everything in common. They were coming together, and they had Christ in common. They had the name of Jesus in common. They had that common spirit, that common love. They were dedicated to the teaching of the of the apostles, so it's communism. They had everything in common, not communism. Communism is forced distribution. This is voluntary distribution. And so not everybody's actually even selling all their homes. It's not like everyone went homeless the very next day um, because they said later they all went house to house. Well, whose houses are they going to? Someone had to hold on to their house. So they did do that. So they were meeting. So as God inspired them to do so, they gave and they met each other's needs. And there's something to be said about this pooling of resources in that church. And we see it here and it's a beautiful thing to do, but it's temporary. We don't see this ongoing in the rest of the New Testament. And so there's a difference between a mandate and a, a prescription of behavior, a, a mindset and a description of behavior. And this is a description of what they, was, what they were doing. This isn't a mandate of everyone should start a church and this is exactly how we should be. Um, Hebrews 10.25 is actually an example of a, a prescription. This is what we should be doing. Don't neglect to meet together as some are in the habit of doing. Okay, But we don't see later on in the epistles um, Christ um, calling and teaching us to sell our possessions. This is a beautiful, natural outpouring of the Holy Spirit and a wonderful response of people. Remember, those people had been gathered in Jerusalem because of the Holy Days. So many of these people... We're giving up, um, going back home. They wanted to stay and continue to get what they had here in Jerusalem. And eventually we know they all do disperse later on. But keep this in mind, this common spirit and this, this love that they had for each other. Um, because we're going to see a big switch as that happens in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. So the Lord added daily to those who are being saved 3,000 uh, souls on the day of Pentecost. And remember, this is the new church. The church is born. In this first birth of the church, 3,000 souls were saved. And if you recall last time, I said that Pentecost was a redemption of Babel and a reclaiming of Babel. Well, this moment here is also has a covenant comparison as well. As Pentecost was a reclaiming of Babel, the response to the word and this holy outpouring and this communal um, communism living that they have here um, and 3,000 souls in particular Luke writes down that are being that are saved is a response to and a reclaiming of Sinai if you recall when the people were called out of Egypt and they ended up over at Sinai and God gives us his word there were people who did not respond correctly to the receiving of God's word they rebelled they rebelled they built an idol they built they built all their gold together right and so on that day the, they had a bad response to the word Right? This day they have a good response and God brings them all together and there's unity and 3,000 souls get added. Go back to Sinai. Do you remember what happens at Sinai when they rebel against God's word? God killed them. <laughs> How many? 3,000. So this is a redemption of Sinai. I said, this is... This is how it was when I, when I gave you the word back at Sinai, and this is how it is now, and 3,000 souls. It's like this complete connection point of um, the old and the new, the foundational and the ongoing testament of, of Jesus Christ. All right, so we now get to chapter 3. And we have this first recorded miracle. Before all the signs and the wonders continue on, we have this first 
miracle that's recorded. Of course, Pentecost is a miracle in and of itself. Um, but this is the first one that the apostles are moving in on and claiming the name of Jesus to perform. But I want us to pause on the word miracle for just a moment here. And when we say a baby is born, we say, oh, it's such a miracle. It's not really a miracle. It's an act of nature. That is exactly what the body was designed to do. Push a baby out. Aren't you glad you don't still have a baby inside of you, right? I mean, that is what it was supposed to do. The sun setting, we say, oh, it's so beautiful. It's miraculous. No, it's not. That's exactly what the sun is supposed to do. It's supposed to go up and down or we move around it. Not miraculous. That is part of natural law. So we want to be careful not to overuse miracle. I mean, go ahead and tell somebody that was a miraculous thing you did, you know, but... Let's not demean the meaning of miracle because when we actually see it, we should really go, no, that's a miracle. And what actually is a miracle? A miracle is something that is defies the law, all right? That God supersedes, comes in and says, these are the laws I put into place. For example, gravity. And we might even say a plane getting up in the air is, is a miracle. No, it's not. It's using different laws of nature to get up into the air, right? But what's going to happen in a minute is we're going to see an actual miracle is going to take place. So Peter and John are going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. It's the ninth hour. And of course, they, um, they understand that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah who filled the, fulfilled the scriptures. And so they're continuing on what they were trying to do. Go to the synagogue. Go get the teaching. This is exactly what they were doing. There's going to come a time when they're going to get kicked out. They're not going to be able to go to the temple anymore. They're not going to be allowed to do that. And there's a dispersion that's going to happen. But right now, this is what they've been doing. They always had got their teaching at the temple. And so they're going to continue on doing this. In fact, later on, um, their teaching of, of the people of, the, of, the, of this life, the angel ends up telling them later on in, in chapter 5. All right. So the church continues with Judaism and they're continuing their daily normal habits. Go to the temple and continue teaching there. It says it was at the uh, ninth hour and the Jews counted time at the, uh, daybreak around six. So the third hour of the day would have been nine o'clock. Sixth hour of the noon, ninth would have been three and so on. So they're going in and it says there was a certain lame man. He was lame from birth. He'd been carried there to the temple uh, uh, by this gate called the beautiful gate. And uh, he's asking alms, as was his custom, from all the people who are coming in. And this gate is actually interesting. It's very well documented in history. Uh, Josephus, a historical Jewish writer, wrote about it. It was also called the Nicanor Gate. It was 75 feet tall, so it's not like a little garden gate. It was a big gate, 75 feet tall. It was covered in Corinthian brass. Josephus said of all the gates of the temple, it was the most beautiful, hence the beautiful gate. He said it was actually more beautiful than the gold or any of the silver, or any of the other engravings <coughs> in the temple. So this was a huge standout feature, this amazing gate. And it was a gate that separated the court of men from the court of women. Women and men didn't um, you know, go into the temples together. And um, so uh, there was this gate and then 15 steps down would have been this lower court, the court of women. And that's where they laid this guy uh, every day he comes and gets laid there and later on in the story of course we learn he's been lame for his whole life 40 years all right think about this 40 years he's been lame oh gosh <laughs> and uh, 40 years this guy's been lame so he's been lame during the time that jesus had his ministry right right and he went through this gates jesus did and it says that this man was laying there every day at this same gate and Jesus came, and Jesus died, and Jesus rose, and Jesus has ascended by this time. So Jesus probably passed by that guy several times. And he not only passed by him, he taught there, and he healed there, right in this area. But he didn't heal this guy. This guy didn't get healed, right? And I want you to understand that. Jesus didn't heal everybody. In fact, John chapter 5, he goes to the pool of Bethsaida. And how many people does he heal at the pool of Bethsaida? Do you remember? One person. Who is Tons of people there going in for healing. One guy gets healed. All right. Scripture says multitudes of people are sick. What about them? What about their needs? Over and over in Acts, what do we see? God's sovereignty. God's plan. God's timing. Right? And you're aching and you're thinking and you're wondering and you're putting it on yourself. Maybe I'm not praying hard enough. Maybe they don't have enough faith. Maybe this doesn't happen. And maybe we all just need to take a deep breath and say maybe it's not time. And for whatever reason, God's saying, wait. Wait for now. So this guy sees Peter and John go to the temple, ask for alms, and he's not looking for a miracle. He's looking for a handout. He doesn't want healing. He wants the money, right? 
and he wants these coins, and so he fixes his eyes, it says, and he looks right at Peter, and he gave him his attention, expecting to receive something from them, and Peter says to him those beautiful words from a song I remember as a kid, uh, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you, Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and he lifted him up and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. And this part's kind of cool because Luke's a doctor. And this is a medical term when you read it in the Greek, the way Luke describes it there. So what's this man's response? Absolute, spontaneous, correct, natural response to someone being miraculously healed. Total ecstasy. Dancing around, prancing around, making an absolute spectacle of himself, right? This is what you would expect from someone. This is the correct response. If there's a correct way to respond, this guy nails it, right? Have you ever seen those audiences when someone wins? Maybe you're at a a little thing and there's a function, someone calls off a number and they won some big prize and you're like, ooh, even one. And some little demure person in the back is like, me. And you're like, wait, you just you should be screaming and shouting and jumping up and down. I used to tell my students when they want to wait, raise their hand, elbows to ears, get it up there. Let's like everybody know. And that's what this guy is. He's elbows to ears and his feet and his ankles and his knees and everything. And he's dancing around, leaping, began to walk <laughs> into the temple. Listen to all the verbs that Luke uses here. Leaping up, stood up, began to walk, into the temple, walking, leaping, praising. And the people saw him walking and praising. How could they miss him? And recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter, all the people, utterly astounded, ran to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own own power or piety, we have made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus. So, back up a little bit. Solomon's porch, Solomon's portico, uh, there were a lot of ways to refer to this in this temple area, was a double marble columned porch, and the reason why it was called Solomon's was because it was the, the last remaining part of actual frame of Solomon's temple when Solomon's temple was still there. It was the, the base of that was still there. It was enormous. And Jesus also taught here. And this is where many of the disciples would gather. It was huge and it was covered so people could get in there um, if, if, even if the weather was bad. So Peter sees this. He responds to the people Men of Israel, why are you shocked? Why are you marveling at this? Why do you look so intently as though it was us that was doing this? And I love how Peter says this. He says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why? Why doesn't he just say God did this? Because he knows his audience. He's speaking to a Jewish audience. That's how Jewish people referred to God. Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the covenant God. Not only that, look at this. He says, his servant Jesus, his servant Jesus. You know why Peter does that? Because he's also a man who knows his audience again, because his audience was Jewish and they, he was surrounded by people who knew what they were talking about. Scribes, Pharisees in their audience. He knew that. He knew how to address them to get their attention because he remembers that four times in the book of Isaiah, 49, 42, uh, 42, 49, 50, uh, 52, and all the way to the end of 43, um, we call these uh, the messianic songs or psalms in um, in uh, Isaiah, and so he speaks along these lines. So it kind of starts should be triggering in their mind to be thinking about the Messiah Jesus. And he continues, "Whom you delivered." <laughs> so he's got this great audience. He addresses it correctly. God, right? And they've just seen this miracle. They're witnessing this guy still prancing around and now clinging, probably shaking with joy and excitement, maybe double-checking his ankles. And he shifts and he says, who you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate. I mean, that's just right to buzzkill right there. Just like, yeah, yeah, everything's great. And all of a sudden, slam, right to them. And you denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one, asked for a murderer to be granted to you. You killed the author of life. And I love the, the, the choice of words here he uses, who God raised from the dead. We've got kill and life and author and God raising him from the dead. And to this we are witnesses. Because why? He's an apostle. And that was a requirement to be an apostle. That word there, author of life, is a fascinating word. And it's really interesting that Peter um, uses this word here. 
Um, the word is archegos, archegos, and it can be translated prince. Maybe one of your Bibles might even say prince, um, originator, even leader. It's the first from which everything else comes afterwards, and the ESV translates it here, author. But it's more than just somebody writing. It's like the originator of everything, the author of of life. The other fascinating thing, I want you to hold on to this little nugget about this Greek word archegos, is we get our word arch out of it. Do you see A-R-C-H, arch, in there? I want you to picture an arch, maybe a, a Roman um, a stonework arch in your mind and hold that into your brain because that's going to come up again in just a moment. All right, so he continues, verse 16. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given this man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And I love this verse, verse because I said it wasn't the lame man's faith, it was Peter's faith, because he, the lame man wasn't asking for a healing. I just have so much faith that you'll heal me. He doesn't ask, he was asking for a hand on. He wasn't asking for healing at all, all right? So he goes, he can't even take credit for the faith himself, Peter. He switches it on and says, look, it, I was the one who had the faith that I could heal him, but it wasn't even me. And he directs it all up to Jesus Christ and the, the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 17. And now, brothers, I know you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ, his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. He says, look, you're not ignorant anymore. You were ignorant back then. Jesus even said to himself, Father, what? Forgive that they don't know what they're doing. But you're not ignorant anymore. What do you need to do with this information? What do you, what do you move on from here? Where is, how is your response? We have the body of Christ coming together and responding correctly. Unlike the people at Sinai where God strikes down 3,000 people. The body of Christ comes together in the power of the Holy Spirit and they respond correctly and they bring together community, right? They live in that power. And then we have this, um, a lame man being healed. And he responds correctly, unlike the leprosy guy. Remember the lepers? And uh, the one guy is the only guy who comes back and, and has thanksgiving in his heart for Jesus. And all the other guys walk away and don't even thank Jesus. They don't respond correctly. The one guy does. This lame guy responds correctly, shouting, dancing, praising, clinging, not just running off, but staying there, clinging to the apostles. And now it's the leader's choice. Now it's their chance. Are they going to take it and run with it and go in the correct direction? Are they going to respond the way they should to the name of Jesus? He point blanks it with them. Verse 19, repent. You're not ignorant anymore. You have all the information you possibly could need. Repent. Turn back that your sins may be blotted out and times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you from heaven must receive until the time of restoring for all things about which God spoke of by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. And he goes and talk, reminds them that Moses himself prophesied that this man, Jesus, would come. He quotes from Deuteronomy 18, this famous passage about Moses saying that God's going to raise up another prophet like me. And the Jewish nation believed that their Messiah would be God's anointed. And Messiah means that, God's anointed prophet. They looked for a Messiah prophet. So he's quoting this passage from Deuteronomy 18. And remember in Hebrew study, in, in the beginning of Hebrews, God said, he said, um, God who spoke in times past, past in a variety of ways to our fathers, through the prophets, in, the, in these last days, he has spoken through his what? Son. That's it. That verb, God has spoken through Christ, back in Hebrews, is aorist, active, indicative, and it's once and for all, and it's done. God spoke in times past through prophets. God has once and for all now spoken through Jesus Christ. In other words, when it comes to salvation, there's nothing more to be said. Jesus is the final word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So Jesus is God's wrap-up final word on salvation. And I hope that's the same for you in your life. That Jesus is the final word in your life. I hope you have repented of your sins. I hope that you have given your life to God. I hope that you truly trust in him and not in any religion. I hope that you're not trusting in your works. I hope that you're not trusting in your parents' faith. I hope that you have your own faith because Jesus is the author of that faith. And that is the name in which we are all accountable to repent to. And so the apostles and the people... Responding correctly in generosity and in community and joy and the lame man responding with this exuberant praise and praising God and the leaders now have their chance to respond. And actually, what should we do every day? Open up our eyes every day 
and thank God for that day to breathe and say, God, what have you got for me today? I mean, I want us to go back. and We're going to hang on here just a second. I want us to go back to Peter and John waking up and doing what they were supposed to do. Go to the temple to pray. That is what they did. They went to the temple to pray. Did they go and thinking, let's go heal us a lame man. <laughs> let's, no, just go to the temple. Do what you're supposed to do. And let God bring along your path the things that he's going to do that are going to change your life and the people's lives around you that he brings to you. So they are responding correctly. They're getting up. They're showing up. They're doing it every day. And don't ever dismiss the, the, the power of those good daily habits that you have, hopefully, that we all try to have, right? All right. So the religious leaders, the religious <laughs> leaders, do they respond correctly? Do they receive the word? No, they do not. So right here we have this interruption and the persecution begins. So we have this joy. We have this exuberance. We have all the power and the miracles and everything that's going on. And we have this interruption moment right here in this part of the passage. And after the birth of the church is the persecution of the church. And this is the first recorded beginning of the persecution of the followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus has ascended. The disciples are gathered in Jerusalem. It's great a miracle. It invites the eyes of the whole world to check it out. What's going on here? And look carefully what happens here. The establishment doesn't like it. So the Great Commission, the great preaching of the gospel, it has and it always will invite persecution. And this is the beginning of the persecution of the church. For the next 300 years, the church of Jesus Christ is going to be going through the worst, most notable persecution in history. In fact, most historians point to 10 waves that begin here of persecution that start with Nero about 67 A.D., this is what happens at Jerusalem. The Roman Empire comes against Christianity until Diocletian around 303, and then wave after wave after wave persecution. And I'm not saying things like, you know, they're going to laugh at the bumper sticker or your shirt or your comments about Jesus or praying at a restaurant or whatever. That's the kind of persecution you and I might get in our beautiful country here in America. I mean, they get physical persecution, as you well know. They get beaten. They get scourged. They get beheaded right? They're going to be taken by Caesar, some of them, given wax shirt and lit as living torches and candles in the gardens of Rome. That's the kind of persecution we're talking about. In our culture, we don't see that kind of persecution here. Sunny Southern California, the kind of persecution we deal with is maybe the persecution of our own ego. Our ego gets persecuted. We get scorned. We get maligned. We get sidelined and we think, oh, people won't like me if I stand up for Jesus Christ, right? It's still persecution, but persecution in the West pales to what people are going through then and certainly what they're going through in the Middle East and parts of North Africa today. So chapter 4. As they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed <laughs> because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So verse 1, chapter 4. They speak to the people. Remember, P Peter has preached this message in Solomon's portico. And then as they speak to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees come upon them and they're annoyed. The word there could be translated disturbed. And stop right there. Think about it. The gospel is disturbing. And people do get annoyed. All right? The gospel isn't first there to comfort. The gospel is to give good news, but you don't get good news unless you know that there's bad news. And that bad news is irritating sometimes. Oftentimes. And it's certainly disturbing and annoying, clearly to these religious leaders. So, they arrest them. <laughs> they put them in custody until the next day. And they have to think about it, what they're going to do, because it's already evening. Sadducees, verse 1. They come upon them greatly disturbed because they had taught the people and they preached that Jesus had resurrected from the dead. Remember, we talked about this before. Sadducees don't believe in anything supernatural. No resurrection from the dead. So the fact that they're teaching this is making them really annoyed because not only are they teaching this and they don't believe it, but they're kind of upsetting the order. And the Sadducees were the ones who had partnership pretty strongly with Rome. And they wanted to keep the status quo with Rome. Okay, And so they don't like any of that. In fact, if you think about the Gospels, we mostly hear from the Pharisees. From this point forward, we're going to mostly hear from the Sadducees um, getting irritated with what's going on here. So, verse 4. But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. And on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem, all those um, men, John, Alexander, and so on, and they set them in their midst. They inquired the big question. The question that, again, if you answer correctly, 
and respond to the answer correctly, you know, do not pass go, collect $200, you go straight to the win, you got it all, this is the big answer, by what power or what name did you do this? And they should say Jesus, and everyone should go, really? That's the guy we've been looking for all along, we're in, no, okay, no. So this is a loaded question, though, by what name did you do this? Because in their scripture, the Old Testament, they were commanded when anyone comes in and does something notable, like a miracle, a sign, a wonder, anything like that, they were supposed to ask, in whose name do you do this? All right? And if that person is leading them away from God, they were supposed to stone them. All right? Pick up rocks and stone them. So they're waiting for this answer. What name are you doing this in? All right? What name is this? By the name of Jesus, if they say, it's like they're... They're rocked and loaded. They're ready to go. Just tell us exactly who you're doing this in. I want you to notice who's mentioned here. First on the list, besides the elders, Annas. He's the high priest. Caiaphas, he was the residing high priest. And here's what's ironic. Peter and John, the disciples of, of Jesus, of course, are standing before the exact same group that Jesus had stood before when he was tried before the Jewish Sanhedrin. Peter was outside warming himself in the courtyard when all that trial was going on. Now here's Peter, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's bold. And do you remember that night that Jesus stood trial before Annas and Caiaphas? Peter was outside in the courtyard by a fire with that servant girl, and now he's inside in front of them, different, filled with the Spirit. So Jesus had made Peter and his disciples a promise. Do you remember that back in Luke? He said, don't worry about what you're going to say. Don't worry about what you're going to speak when you're called in before the authorities. I don't know about you, but if I had heard that Jesus saying that to me, I thought, I'm going to be called before authorities. That's what I would be thinking. And he says, don't worry when you're called before the authorities because um, you're going to have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to teach you what to say in that moment when you need it. And so this is that moment. He's right there, ready. And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, says, rulers... Of the, uh, of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed, that Greek word there is actually benefaction, a benefaction. This was very important in Greek um, society, by the way. So he's actually using this word strategically because a benefaction in, in um, uh, Greek and Roman culture, you don't mess with somebody who's doing a good deed. In fact, you're supposed to give them praise. So he's basically bringing this whole Greek cultural thing in front of them because remember, who are the Sanhedrin in bed with, basically? The, the political leaders, they, they want to keep everybody happy. So Peter makes a big deal about saying, you're getting on our case for making this benefaction, this good deed, when you know darn well that the law of the land says, don't mess with anybody doing a good deed, let them go and praise them publicly. And you're questioning us publicly, you know, put aside the law of God and just the law of the land that you're kissing up to. So he, he's very strategic in saying it that way. Um, you're concerning a benefaction done to a crippled man by what means this man has been healed let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified whom God raised from the dead by him this man is standing before you well All right. and he does something very interesting he turns the accusation back on them by what power by what name are you doing this he flips it on them and shows the absurdity of this entire mock trial, basically, that's going on before them. He's a, here's a guy, he can't walk, and now he can. He's been in this temple for years, since his birth. He's begged for alms, and we're on trial <coughs> for helping him, for miraculously healing him. You're accusing us about this. And pause and consider this as well. Annas and Caiaphas, who had stared Jesus in the eye and had heard him speak the words that he did, and I'm sure when Jesus spoke to them, they must have felt some conviction. The Holy Spirit was present there. Like, there's something different about this man. They know it. And I can't help but think they're thinking the same thing right now as Peter is speaking. Because Peter is himself filled with the Holy Spirit as he's speaking. And they're feeling that feeling all over again. And you see, they have a problem. The problem is, they don't believe in Jesus. <laughs> they don't believe in the resurrection. They have everything they've ever established been, is staked on that. The denial of Jesus, the denial of supernatural, the denial of the resurrection. And here we go. We have this miracle. It's just happened. No one can deny it. It's right there in front of them. So what shall we do? What shall we do? Well, I have an answer. Believe in Jesus. <laughs> That's what you should do. All right. At this point, Jesus is, was dead and now he's alive. A lame man can now walk and leap and praise God. 
You should believe in Jesus. That's what your response should be. But it's amazing how deep unbelief will go. And so they have a problem. And the problem is Jesus. The one that you killed, Peter says. This man, verse 10, stands before you whole. Now, here's the principle. The greatest argument, the greatest argument for the power of Jesus Christ in his name is a changed life. That's the greatest argument. A cripple can walk. The greatest advertisement that Jesus could ever take out, the greatest advertisement ever for the gospel is to have a life changed. All right? You can argue, you can debate, you can discuss, but it's a changed life that makes the difference. You can't argue with, I was once blind and now I see. I was once lame, but now I walk. I was once a selfish son of a gun and now I am unselfish and giving and patient and kind. It's a changed life life all right verse 11 this jesus is the stone that was rejected by you the builders which has become the cornerstone of all scriptures he could have brought up to point to the messiah why this one he's standing in the temple he's just called jesus the author of life the archegos the arch you picture that roman arch picture the structural all right? If you take your left hand and your right hand, you start adding stones up, stone by stone, making that arch and coming together. What is needed in the middle of that archway to hold those two rows of stones coming up? Capstone. That has to go there. That has to go there. Peter is being very strategic and very visual by choosing this particular scripture when there could have been any other number of scriptures he could have chosen, this is the one he chooses. He's quoting Psalm 118, which says, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, the archegos. Now, along with that scripture comes this old story. I'm going to tell you the story that they read about to help you understand this. I thought it was pretty cool. Some people call it a legend. Uh, maybe it's an actual story, but they tell it when you take your tours in um, Israel. You know, some of the tour guides will tell the story. The legend goes like this. Um, in the days when the Solomon's temple was being built, uh, and then we know from that, that uh, in scripture, that they didn't quarry the stones right there at the temple site. All right? they, they had an actual quarry and then they brought them all up because they didn't want to have the sound of a hammer or a chisel going on at the building of the temple in Jerusalem. So they quarried it over at this quarry site and they moved the stones that were already cut perfectly. They moved them to the temple and that's where they placed them. And they were so accurate in cutting the stones, it says, that there was no mortar, no uh, cement, no, and there was no gap. They were so precise they could sl slice a thin knife right between the stones and there, there would be no room for a knife. All right, so the stones were um, sliced and hewn at this quarry. They're brought to the building side of the temple. And they were all laid out, and the builders would follow the schematic and pick up one stone. I'm like, I'm not you're picking up, but, you know, they, they'd move into place correctly. <laughs> there were the stones that were sent over. Um, and so the story goes that one of the stones that shows up has this odd shape. And none of the builders knew where to fit it. And so they sort of didn't know what to do with it. And they, they pushed it down to a rubbish heap. And some say they actually rolled it into the Kidron Valley um, to be taken up later from where they rejected, which is right behind Golgotha, by the way. Um, so they rolled it down the Kidron Valley to be taken up later because they rejected it. And it was a stone that doesn't fit anywhere until the temple was almost done and they're missing the capstone. That's the cornerstone. And they say, we have every stone, but tell the quarry that they need us to send us the cornerstone or this capstone. And the head guy at the quarry says, hey, I already sent it to you. And uh, we sent it a while ago. And someone remembers, they realize, oh, that was that stone that we rejected. That was that stone that we sent off. That was that stone that we marginalized because it didn't fit anywhere. And we pushed it out and we rejected it. And then they found that stone and they brought it back up and they put it in place. All right. That's the legend of, of, of the stone. So it's not scripture, but I thought it was very fascinating. Go, go tour Israel. I'm sure you'll hear the story from one of them there as well. That's where I heard it. So now, from a friend. No, I didn't go to Israel. So he's quoting Psalm 118. And of, of all the Psalms that could have any messianic, it's fascinating that he picks this one. And he says then, continuing on in verse 12, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they bowed their knee and prayed and accepted Jesus and repented and said a sinner's prayer. And no, okay, sorry, wrong, wrong version. <laughs> and they perceived they were uneducated common men, that they were astonished. And they, they recognized that they had been with Jesus, but seeing the man was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. We can't say anything. These guys are 
not as educated as we are, yet they speak with education, and we can't deny that, and we also can't deny that this guy has been healed, whatever shall we do? I know what you should do. Repent. <laughs> All right, so here's the deal. It's recognizable when you've been with Jesus. People can see it. It oozes off of you. It's, there's a different light in your eyes. There's a difference in your demeanor altogether, and they're seeing the same thing here. All right. They realize that they've been with Jesus, and seeing the man who'd been healed standing with them, talk about evidence, talk about proof, talk about nothing else that you could possibly deny. It's very miraculous. They can't say anything about it, but when they command them to go outside the council, they conferred among themselves. What are we going to do with this? So what do they decide to do? He severely threatened them. They, they charged them not to speak or teach at all in what? The name of Jesus. Stop with the name of Jesus business. You're going to find it fascinating in this next chapter coming up because they're going to hear the names of some other <clears throat> prophets that came before Jesus. False prophets, teachers who started taking people away. No one commands anything along those. This they get. There is something to be said here about the name of Jesus. And so they say this. And Peter and John answer them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Ladies, you won't be able to speak if you haven't seen and heard. That's the deal. They have experienced the Holy Spirit. They have been in the presence of Jesus Christ. And we, you, I, all of us have the opportunity to do that as well as we come to the word of God. You will be able to say, this is what I've seen in the word of God. This is what I've heard in the word of God. This is what I've seen in the testimony of the women and men in my life. No one will be able to deny that. But be in the word. Be in fellowship. Connect with one another. Hear each other's stories. Bounce back and forth from each other so we can get this. Read the powerful biographies of men and women who have gone before us. All right? Because like Peter and Paul, uh, Peter and John, they, you will be able to say we cannot but speak of what we have seen here. Nothing will be able to stop you. All right. So the Sadducees, they did not expect to hear that. What did they expect? What were they banking on? Yes, sir, Mr. Sadducee, sir. All right. That's what they're expecting. But Peter and John appealed to a higher court, a higher Supreme Court than their court, the courts of heaven, the throne room of heaven. And whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you decide. You judge. We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Now, what was the issue to the apostles? The issue was, what is right? What is right? That's the issue with them. We're not, uh, we're going to do what's right. We're not going to do what's safe. We're not going to do what's popular. We're not going to do what's easy. We're going to do what's right. All right? How do they have that level of conviction about what's right? They have the Holy Spirit. God had told them, I will speak. I will give you the Holy Spirit. I will enable you to be bold in that moment. That is available to all of us today as well. If there is a way for Peter and John to obey both authorities in heaven and earth, then they will do it because we know that's what the word of God says. But they say no. Whether it is right for us to obey you or the word of God, you can judge, but we will speak. And verse 21, and when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. And then Luke reminds us that the man who had the sign of healing was performed from, was more than 40 years old. And let's review that again. How long had he been lame? His entire life. 40 years. Remember, he'd been at the temple when Jesus was teaching and Jesus was healing there. So you think Jesus healed everybody he saw? Everybody's sickness was healed? No. You think Jesus was like, catch them all, Pokemon, oh, I missed one, and go get this guy over here? No. He walked right by that guy. Did not heal him. I don't know why that, that part just really, it really hit me as I was preparing for this. This talk today. Because I want healing in my life. And I want it yesterday. And I know you do too. I know you want it for your friends and loved ones. But Jesus walked by that guy. I 
And that guy came to the temple, and he kept on coming to the temple. And then Peter and John, in response to the power of the Holy Spirit, did it too. And they went to the temple. And here's the deal. This shows you the wisdom of God. This is the perfect time, listen, for the maximum glory of God. Could Jesus have healed that guy any time? Absolutely. Absolutely. This was the time. This was the maximum glory to God. Right there in Jerusalem in that very moment. And all the people, all the leaders, Peter and John and all the apostles get this confirmation, get this miracle. And they have to deal with the power of the name of Jesus in that moment. Because God did not heal that man in that moment. So Jesus walked by that man at the temple during his ministry. And I bet he was thinking, oh, your day is coming. You hang on. Your day is coming. Ladies, there is power in the name of Jesus. But we do not wield it in our time. There is power in the name of Jesus. And it's God's wisdom. God's time. That does not mean we stop, we hold back, we wait, we second guess, we wonder, maybe I don't have enough faith, maybe I'm not praying hard enough, maybe I shouldn't have done this, maybe I should have done that. We say go to the word of God and we continue to, well, like go to the temple, keep praying, do the things, right? And trust. And maybe Jesus, you felt like he's walked by you and hasn't reached out to heal you. And maybe he's thinking like he, he knew back then. Your day's coming. Your day's coming. And the big grand scheme of things, we know it all will be there. We're not guaranteed it. healing and restoration this side of heaven, but that day is coming. And Lord, as we close in prayer in a moment, I'm going to pray, God, that we would not only trust in the power of the name of Jesus, but we would trust in timing as well. Let's join hands around the table as we close in prayer. Father God, we do thank you for the power of your word. And we long to have that, that power. And we long for the healing, we long for the restoration, and we long for things to be made right. And Lord, we just ask today that you would give us the patience and the faith to trust and to wait and to hold on to you and to your promises and to keep doing, to keep praising, to keep reading, to keep connecting, to feel the hands around our tables right now and say, Lord, I pray for this woman to my right and to my left, and I thank you, God, for her and her testimony. And we lift up one another right now in the name of Jesus and ask, Lord, that you would heal our relationships, our bodies, our minds. And we want it in your timing because that's when you are going to get maximum glory. So God, forgive us when we try to rush it or we get worried or even angry and help us to just rest and wait and live boldly in the power of your name. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Thank you, ladies.